Good morning. Thank you so very, very much for being present this morning. We appreciate your presence here. It's good to see everyone out on an absolutely beautiful day. We are here for, as I always say, for one reason and one reason only, and that is to worship. Worship as we have been commanded in God's holy word. It is clear how he wants us to worship. It's laid out perfectly in his holy word, and that's exactly what we're going to do here this morning. If you're a guest of ours this morning here with us at Midway, thank you so very much for being present. We appreciate your presence. If you have a cell phone, make sure that you have put it on vibrate or silent. And also, when you came in this morning, if you got busy talking and forgot to get your communion packet, you might want to get up right now and, and pick up a communion packet. And there's also the little boxes out there where you drop your contribution. This morning, those that will be assisting with our worship service, Kelly Sims will be leading us in our congregational singing. He's going to start us off with our opening song. After that, Ben Lawler will lead us in our opening prayer. Philip Lawler will be heading the table to close us out. Thomas Brinkyard will be dismissing us in our closing prayer. And at the appropriate time, Mark Howell, the preacher here at Midway, will bring us the message of the hour. Let's at this time get started on our worship to our Heavenly Father. Would you join me in prayer, please? Our most righteous Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you are our God, and we're thankful that you are our Creator. We're thankful that you created man in your image, in your image alone. Father, we pray as we go through this life, we will remember that we are your children. Father, we pray that we will honor your respect and glory throughout our days. Father, we're so thankful for the many blessings you've given us in this life. You've blessed us with food. You've blessed us with clothing. You've blessed us with shelter. You've blessed us with families. And for all that, Father, we're thankful. Father, we're thankful for this country in which we live. You've blessed us in many ways. We're thankful for the soldiers who have put on the colors of the uniform and gave their lives for freedom. Father, we pray we'll never take this freedom for granted. Father, we acknowledge the problems in this country. Father, we realize that many have put on false gods, chased perverse actions. We pray for these people, Father. We pray that they'll realize the errors of their ways and to correct their lives before it's too late. Father, we're mindful of the people in prisons. We pray that they will somehow be reached through ministry and realize that you are the God and they should serve you. Father, we're mindful of the ones who are facing challenges of life, the ones who are facing sickness and illness. We pray for them and we pray for their families. We pray that you will comfort them in their, at their time of need. Father, we're mindful of the ones who have lost loved ones. 
Father, we pray that they will be comforted today in the days to come. Father, we're mindful of the youth of the church. We pray for them. Father, they're about to face challenges that's going to test their faith. Father, they're going to need to be brave. They're going to need to be courageous. Father, we pray that daily they will grow in your grace and grow in faith to face these challenges. Father, we pray in the future that they will be strong leaders in the church, that they will stand firm on the truth, stand truth, stand firm on the word. Father, we pray for the church here at Midway. We pray for our worship this morning. We pray that this worship will bring glory and honor to your name. And all these things we ask, in Christ's name, amen.
morning and welcome. We're so glad you're here today. Thankful you've chosen to be with us on this beautiful day outside. As we celebrate this tomorrow, Memorial Day, uh, I would ask a question. How many of you know the first Memorial Day that was celebrated in the United States? Now, it's not a test or anything. I'm going to go ahead and give you the answer. The first Memorial Day was celebrated on May 30th, 1868. And it was set aside in order to be able to uh, memorialize, I guess you might say, the soldiers who had fallen in the Civil War. It was first called Decoration Day because what they intended for people to do was to put flowers on the graves of those soldiers who had fallen. And, and so it's caught on, of course, we still celebrate it. Now it includes not just those who had fallen in the Civil War, but in every war that had been fought in, uh, for our nation and it's something that's celebrated every year here in the United States. Now, for many, if not most, when we think about Memorial Day now, generally people think about a long weekend, don't they? Or a three-day weekend, as we sometimes call it. Uh, you get off on Monday because Memorial Day is always on Monday. That was a change. And so some people seem to think, that the only thing it is is another time for recreation and leisure. It's the official kickoff of summer. Now, as I think about that, I want you to think about something with me. By some, or for, uh, for some, you know, when you start thinking about those who have lost their life in battle, uh, to simply celebrate Memorial Day as just another day, just another day for some time off, uh, it could be construed as being disrespectful, could it not, of those who have given their lives. Now, this morning, we're not here to debate that. That's not our purpose. But I do think it could be something that would be a legitimate claim that if we don't remember those, then when we think about what we have, we might not be as grateful for what we have and the opportunities that we have. And as Ben mentioned in the prayer this morning, the freedoms that we have even to come together and worship our Heavenly Father as we have this morning. But this morning, what I want to do is call your attention to a passage that we've already visited this year. Uh, we talked a little bit about it earlier in the year. It's found in the book of Joshua, chapter number 7. But it's there in that passage that we read about the story of Ai, a, 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 a smaller town that was to be conquered. Uh, when the spies went to spy it out, they said, we don't need everybody there. We'll just take a handful of people and we'll be able to run over these people. We'll be able to conquer this. Remember, they had just seen the walls of Jericho fall down. They were emboldened by that. And so they didn't think they needed very many. Now, one of the things that we don't take into account when we're first reading from the book of Joshua, chapter number 7, one of the things that they didn't even know about, many of them, was a problem that was there. When we, when we read, go back to the book of Joshua, chapter 7, at verse number 5, the Bible talks about how that the people of Ai killed about 36 of the men. 36 Israeli or Israelite soldiers. And because of that, having been on this high from the fall of the walls of Jericho, now what happens? The hearts of the people melt. They can't believe what has happened. They now become discouraged. They think that the sky has fallen rather than the walls have fallen. And you can imagine the defeat that they must have felt and the loss that these families must have felt when they lost these 36 men in this battle that never should have happened. These men never should have been killed because of what happened. Now, what, what was wrong? Well, all of us know there was sin in the camp. And that's what led to the defeat at Ai. There was sin in the camp. And in particular, there was one man and his family that had done what God had told them not to do. And you remember how God had said that everything in Jericho was to be utterly destroyed. But... Achan said, I saw some money and I saw some clothes. And I took them and I hid them in the ground in my tent. And so as we look at it, we know that there was a problem that was there. But when we think about that sin 
in the camp. I have to go back to verse number 1 of this chapter. The Bible there says, but the people of Israel broke faith. Now wait a minute. There was one person who had done this. His family was involved evidently. But the Bible says the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things for Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things. And the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Now wait a minute. Is that fair? That we have one man and one family, and yet God is punishing Israel? What about those 36 men? Now we know that Achan, he, he disrespected God, did he not? He did what God told him not to do, so he disrespected God. But could it be said that he also disrespected those 36 men and their families? And I think there's a good case that could be made in regard to that. That because of him, people died. Did he intend for it to happen that way? I don't think so. He just wanted what he saw. He was enticed by it. He took it. But he didn't intend for anybody to die. And yet his actions disrespected them to the point that they lost their life. Now through Joshua, God said that the Israelites had to do something. Now what was it they had to do? They had to take Achan, his family, and everything that belonged to them, even their, even their belongings and their, and their livestock, and to burn them with fire. And so we find out that's exactly what they did. God prescribed that in Joshua chapter 7 at verse number 15. Now, think about something with me. What if the children of Israel had begun to reason and say, you know what, that's an awfully harsh punishment. To take not only Achan, but to take his family, his wife and his children and everything he has, and, and, and they... Perhaps we'll just imagine for a moment, they decided they're not going to carry that out. It's too harsh. But in reality, was it? If they had decided that, they would have disrespected God and His law, would they not? But let me ask you this. If they had chosen not to punish Achan in the way that God had prescribed that he be punished, could it be said that the entire nation would have disrespected those 36 fallen soldiers because they did not render judgment as God had told them to do. Again, I think there's a great case that could be made in that regard. But we know that they did. We know that they carried out the execution. We know that everything was done. They purged the sin from among the nation. And as a result of that, we go to Acts chapter 8 at verse number 1. And in chapter 8 at verse number 1, what do we find? The Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear, do not be dismayed. Take all the fighting men with you. Arise, that's our theme, and go to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai and his people, his city and his land. You know what the children of Israel did after they had carried out the execution, they had purged the sin from the, from the nation. God told them to arise, and what did they do? Verse number 3, they arose. They arose and they went, and they defeated Ai. And so what lessons can we learn when we think about what is happening here? What lessons do we need to learn? Well, number one, even though we might not think it was such a bad thing, that Achan did, do you know what God calls it? The Bible says that there was an outrageous thing that was done in, the, in Israel. By him taking this, what God told him not to do, it was an outrageous thing that he had done. 
That's said in verse number 15 I mentioned a moment ago. And he who is taken with the devoted things shall be burned with fire and all that he has because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he has done this outrageous thing in Israel. If we were to look at this idea of a, an outrageous thing, that's the way it's translated in the English Standard Version. Uh, we could go back to the King James and the American Standard Version and, and they translated in this way, this folly. If you were to go to the New King James and the New American Standard, you would find that they translated in this way, He has done a disgraceful thing. A disgraceful thing. Outrageous. The word is defined as a wicked, disgraceful, vile thing. But don't stop right there. A thing that a fool would do. That's within the definition. A thing that a fool would do. That's what foolish Achan had done. This foolish thing. Now, could it be said that there are many things being done in our own nation that could be called by God outrageous, disgraceful, folly? I think, it, I think we could. I think that everything that we see pretty much on the news could pretty well be described in that way, especially in our day and time. Now, if God demanded that the Israelites get the sin out of the camp, what makes us think that God will bless us in our own nation when it is so filled with sin? What makes us think that we're in any better condition than the Israelites? What makes us think that we can arise whenever a foe might come against us and we, everything will be just fine? You know, I'm reminded of what the children of Israel did later on in the time of Jeremiah. And they looked at their temple and they said, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. What did they mean? Ain't nobody coming here to destroy us because we have the temple of God. And within that temple of God, what do we have? The Ark of the Covenant. And that's where God comes down. God's going to protect us. But He didn't. Why? Sin had come back into the camp again. What makes us think that we have it any better. We could expect any more from God. We're talking about arise. And we need in our own nation to arise to many things. Now, as we consider this lesson this morning, what are some of the sins in our camp that our nation could be construed as dishonoring the fallen for? I don't have time to deal with every single one of them this morning. I want to share two. Number one, simply this. Moral corruption and ethical lapses in our leadership. That's one of the sins in our camp. Moral corruption and ethical lapses in our leadership. Now just consider very briefly some of the areas in which this happens. Some of us are old enough to remember what took place back in the 1970s with some of our leaders. They call it Watergate, the Watergate scandal. Some of us are old enough to remember in the 90s the sexual scandal of President Bill Clinton. Most of us in here are old enough to know that our former President Trump had been under all kinds of investigations, just or unjust, and even our own president at this time has scandals relating to his own family that are in the news. You know, the recent Durham investigation revealed multiple instances of abuse of power by law enforcement and intelligence agencies in our nation. When we think about it, there are ongoing issues where governmental leaders have used their power. Senators and representatives not just on the federal level, but even on our state level, even here in our own state, to enrich themselves, even down to the local levels. 
There's those who have done those things that are inappropriate. One of the things that truly boggles my mind is how many teachers we see in our nation who are now being accused of and seemingly convicted of having inappropriate sexual relations with students, which is deemed uh, as a, an abuse of power by an authority figure. You know, we have a whole lot going on. But are these things that would be considered sin in our camp, are, are they not, not only disrespecting God, but even disrespecting those who have bled and died for our nation to make it free from these things. We have a problem, a great problem. You know, as I think about the Bible, I'm reminded of what is said in Proverbs 20 to 29 at verse number 2. When the righteous increase the people rejoice. But it's the last part of this that I want to focus on. But where the wicked rule, we're talking about leadership there, where the wicked rule, the people groan. Proverb in the Old Testament. When the wicked rule, the people groan. You know what? This passage highlights the impact of leaders' moral character on the well-being of their communities ever how large that community might be. Now, ethical lapses in leadership can lead to suffering and discontent. That's how, in ways that it impacts so many people a lot of times. Did it not, the sin of Achan, did it not affect the entire camp in some ways? Now, there are two ways that we could imagine this morning that this groaning that's mentioned here in Proverbs 29 at verse number 2, uh, how it can be brought about or some symptoms of it, we might say. As we think about it, the moral corruption and ethical lapses of our leadership leads to an erosion of trust. An erosion of trust. How many, if I were to ask for a show of hands this morning, trust your government? Not many people would raise their hand. Matter of fact, the news agencies sometimes do those polls, don't they? And you know what? A majority of those in the polls over the past few years have raised their hand and said, no, we no longer trust our leaders. We no longer trust those who are in leadership positions. And so when we think about that, all of this can lead to disillusionment. It can lead to a breakdown in social cohesion, I guess you might say, because people won't trust even the law enforcement officers. Haven't we had a problem with that in recent years? All the way down to the local levels in those ways. These men may have done nothing wrong. These men may be fine upstanding men seeking to do what's right. But trust has been broken, even to those places. You know, when you see the riots that have taken place over the past few years, when you look at those things, what do you see? Do you see a group of ungodly people clamoring for what they don't have and maybe even want to steal? Is that what you see? Now, now granted, I'm not going to argue that that's not happening because there are a lot of ungodly people involved in those things. But you know what? When you look at that group, you see a group of people who have been influenced by morally corrupt and unethical leaders. And it's filtered all the way down. The people grown. In the midst of this, I want you to ask yourself a question. And I want you to think about it. In the midst of this, is it really what so many men and women, upright men and women, have given their life for? 
so that people can do that? I think not. Not only does it lead to that, it also leads to uh, <clears throat> economic hardship, even. What do you mean by that? You know, corruption can hinder economic growth and development. Think about third world countries. You know, in third world countries, what happens the majority of the time? When money comes into the country, who gets it? In the third world country, the leaders get it. What does, that, what does that do to the country? Does it help it? Is the economic situation better because of it? Are most third world countries poverty stricken throughout? Absolutely. What makes us think our nation, when leaders get to that point, what makes us think our nation would be any different? economic hardships that can come forth. And, and you know what? As these economic hardships come forth, it, it continues to exasperate the poverty. It limits the opportunities that people can have. It deepens economic uh, hardships. And what does it do? It leads to unrest and upheaval in our nation. Proverbs 29, verse 2, When the righteous increase, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people groan. Not only do we see this moral corruption, but here's something else that we need to consider in our own nation. Another of the sins in our camp of our nation might be called the normalization of hate speech and intolerance the normalization of hate speech and intolerance. You know what? When many people in our nation hear those words that I just spoke, they tend to think of Christians and others who are living moral lives as being those who are using hate speech. Right? That's who they automatically jump to. Those who would seek to do what God says. But there's a real problem. And the real problem is not that the Christians are the ones who are using the hate speech and practicing intolerance. You know what? There's such a thing as intolerance in the name of tolerance. And that has pervaded our nation. It's really a paradox of sorts. A paradoxical situation as one person described it. Whenever we think about this idea of tolerance or intolerance in the name of tolerance, we can see it in the rise of cancel culture. You know, those who, those who want to cancel someone because they say something that hurts my feelings and I don't agree with them. We want them to lose their job, their living, everything they've got. One of the most hypocritical things a person can say is don't judge me. Did you hear what I said? One of the most hypocritical things a person of any age, of any color, of any religion, one of the most hypocritical things that person can say is don't judge me. You know, they get that from Matthew chapter 7 at verse number 1, or at least they think they do, where Jesus spoke the words in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, judge not that you be not judged. And, and you know what? There's a lot of people who don't even believe the Bible that this has become their favorite verse, it seems like. And they like to quote it or at least attempt to quote it. But when we, when we look at this practice, I, I need you to ask yourself a question. When you say, don't judge me, and you're wrong, now listen to what I said, you're wrong for judging me, which is the idea behind don't judge me, you're wrong for judging me, what has that person done? 
exactly what they say don't do. They have judged you. And as a matter of fact, they have violated what is said in Matthew chapter 7 at verse 1, especially in our day because they have judged people harshly, which is what is being spoken about here in Matthew chapter 7 at verse number 1. If you go to the book of John chapter 7 at verse number 24, evidently they didn't read that far. The Bible there says, Do not judge by appearance, but judge with right judgment. King James says, Judge righteous judgment. How are the majority out in our world judging today? By appearance. You appear not to agree with me. And as a result of that, don't judge me. You can't do that. It's wrong. You hypocrite. You hypocrite. Judge with right judgment. Matthew 7 warns against this hypocritical judgment and encourages self-reflection while John 7, 24 emphasizes the need for discernment and making fair judgments based on truth rather than superficial appearances. Again, ask yourself if this is, this is what so many upright men have given their lives in battle for in our own nation? Or is it disrespecting those men and women by living a life of that sort? Wow. Very quickly this morning, what can Christians do to help rid the camp of these and other sins? Let me suggest three things this morning. Number one, you can help by living a life of integrity and moral courage yourself. You've got to start at home. It starts with you, and it starts with me. If we want to make a difference, we have to start with us. And so we have to set the example of living a life of moral courage and integrity ourselves. There's a passage in the book of Psalms, Psalm 15, the whole Psalm, five verses of it. O oh Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell in your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. Do you know what that describes? That describes a righteous person who stands for truth and godliness. And that's what we need. That's who we need to be. That's who every Christian should be in his or her life. And so we need to, we need to make sure that we start at home. Number two... A Christian can help by teaching your children. Teaching your children. You know, back in the Old Testament, book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, Moses wrote about teaching their children. He said, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise up. You're talking about God's laws at every opportunity that you have. Teaching your children God's laws. You know, when we make ethical decisions and stand up for justice and treat others with dignity and all of these things, and then reinforce that with the teaching of God's Word, isn't that helping to shape the character of those who come after us? Starting in our own families? And if God demanded that the Israelites teach their children these things, His principles, by the way, 
If you read Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7 in its context, what you're going to find is back in chapter number 5, you've just read those five or those ten commandments that have been laid out. The moral, morality, the religious part, the part about God. Teach your children these things. Does God expect any less of His people? who have given, been given so much more. You know, the generations that are coming of age today, as we look around us, and I don't mean this about every single one of them. I'm talking about as a whole. Are some of the most ignorant, illogical, and irresponsible, and unscrupulous of any generation that has ever lived. But there are still many intelligent, spiritually minded, honorable young folks right here. We need more of these people out in our world, don't we? Amen. In the book of Galatians, chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Do not be deceived. We've been talking about this in our Sunday morning Bible class down at the end of the hall. On this particular passage last couple of uh, weeks. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap everlasting life. That's a lesson that far too many, not just young people, older people as well, haven't learned. And we have to. Sadly, part of the blame for the young people still has to fall on the parents' shoulders who fail to learn the, quest- or f- learn the lessons and fail to teach their own. Very quickly, another thing we can do is we need to select, support, and pray for qualified leaders in our nation. Qualified leaders. Moses seems to have had a pretty good daddy-in-law. His name was Jethro, not Bodine, just Jethro. In the book of Exodus chapter 18, at verse number 21, Jethro tells Moses, he said, Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy, who hate a bribe. Place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. you got to get the right kind of leadership. That was Jethro's point. Did you notice that Jethro said nothing about selecting them from the political party of which you've always been a part? He said, look at the character. Not, not, not all of these superficial things that are out there. Very quickly. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. First of all, I, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and for all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceable or peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. What if ungodly leaders have been selected? We know they're suffering. We already read about that from Proverbs. When Paul wrote this passage and he said, pray for the kings, does anybody know who the king was, who the emperor was in Rome? A man by the name of Nero. One of the most wicked and ungodly men who's ever served as a leader in any place. 
And Paul says you still need to pray. Part of it is to help yourself to be able to do what's right. But he said, pray for the kings. Pray for those who are in authority. Sometimes the prayer for ungodly leaders is not that they'll succeed in their evil, but that we'll be able, that, that God will be able to prevent them, their evil will not prevent us from doing what we need to do. Now, will doing these three things disrespect or honor those men who have fought and died for our nation? The things that I mentioned that Christians can do, and I believe the unanimous answer would have to be they would honor them by seeking these things. You know what? Like Israel in the aftermath of Ai, we have to rid sin from the camp as best as we can. And then like Israel of old, in the days of Ai, we need to continue to arise and go forward, move on, do what is right. Maybe you're here this morning, you've never obeyed the gospel. Maybe you're here and there's something amiss in your life that you need to make corrections. Whatever the case may be, if we can assist you, we're here for you. Come right now as together we stand as we sing.
in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. It says, For often as you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Let's pray. Our loving God, we're so thankful for love that Christ came to this earth to redeem men to thee. We pray of the Father as we eat this bread that we remember Christ's death, how you loved us. In Christ's name we give thanks. Amen. Our loving God, we're so thankful for the blood that was shed for our sins. We pray on the Father that we will drink this cup and remember of that blood in Christ's name. We give thanks. Amen. At this time, we'll give thanks for the offering. We pray, Heavenly Father, we have prepared a mount to give to Thee that Thou accept. Knowing, dear God, all these things that we have come from Thee. In Christ's name we give thanks. Amen. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Thomas, who will be coming in a moment and leading us in a closing prayer. And thank you, Mark, for the lesson of the hour. And all I can say is amen to that. Amen. Appreciate that lesson so very much. Because believe you me, I could get up on my soapbox and talk about our government right now. Don't forget, keep in mind, if you have not picked up a bulletin, do so. There are names in there that are asking for our prayers. I also do have some other names that have been added that are asking for us, asking us for us to remember them in our prayers. Ed Griffith is uh, at home sick. Let's remember Ed. Maylene Porter, this is the mother of Marlene, uh, may possibly have pneumonia. She's in Walker Brookwood Baptist. I have to try to remember that, not Walker Baptist anymore. Walker Brookwood Baptist Hospital at this time. Uh, keep Maylene Porter in your prayers. And also, the dishes from the Catherine Chambliss family is out in the foyer. If you've got a dish that you need to pick up, uh, do so. I was given a card. The Chambliss family uh, thanks us so very much for the food, the prayers, the thoughts, the kindness, all the different acts during the passing of Catherine Chambliss, and that will be posted uh, in the bulletin and on PowerPoint. Our sympathy to them and our sympathy to the Thompson family as well. Remember our gospel meeting, homecoming, will be next Sunday. Make your plans to be present for that. Be planning to be here. If you can invite someone and bring someone with you, there are flyers out in the lobby that you can hand out if you want to hand a flyer out uh, in regard to our gospel meeting. And also, uh, the schedule for next Sunday is posted in the bulletin. Be looking at that. If you'll remember, we always have a fellowship meal, and hopefully everyone will stay for that. I believe that gets the announcements at this time. Let me say again, thank you so very, very much for your presence here this morning. It has been a privilege, a privilege that we can assemble together and to worship our God. I'm sure if we stood at this time and talked with someone from Ukraine, they would tell us how vitally important and how privileged we are to be able to assemble in this building without fear, without war, and to be able to worship our God because they are not able to do that right now. Let's not take these privileges for granted that we have. And I hope that everyone has a very safe uh, Memorial Day weekend. We have one more song, closing song, that Kaylee's going to lead us in. Then we will have our dismissal prayer. And I uh, hope you plan to stay for classes after the dismissal prayer. Please stand. I love to tell the
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity we've had to come together to worship you in freedom. We pray that you be with us when we take the lesson what we've heard and apply in our lives. We pray that we go from here and to reach out to those around us. We thank you for the families and the those ladies and gentlemen and um, that serve this country to allow us to have these freedoms. Uh, we pray that we never take that for granted. Please be with us and keep us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.